And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, one half of the double-headed monster that is Awful Good Games, and the creator of Dungeons and Delvers, which is going to be developing a second edition sometime next year. The one and only David Gill. How are you doing tonight, man? It's good to be back. <laughs> it's good it's good to have you back. Um So I know it's I know it's been I know it's been quite quite a bit. What if um and I, I do want to give you your congrats for managing to get the Red Book out there, the monstrosity that it is, which is the reason I haven't done a follow-up review, because that's a lot for me to cover, and the last three scripts I tried to, I tried to cover it, I wasn't satisfied. Well, in the last edition, I, I wasn't fully satisfied myself, because we've been looking back going like, you know what, we could do this and that differently, so that's where the second edition comes into play, so... Mm -hmm. No worries, no biggie. And I know it's a pretty, uh, the letter size book is pretty big at like 500 and something pages. More than I think people expect out of a small indie company, especially with just two people. Yeah. And with the, with that kind of, with that kind of thing in mind, um, Obvious, obviously, it was a long. Obviously, when you, when you're doing with, dealing with a two person show, it's a lot of a lot of man hours go go into go into developing. But what I'd like you to walk me through the moment when you start when you start to think about do do actually going full on and doing a set a second edition instead of just putting out some errata. Um, yeah, I guess like an an, an errata thing would be oh. We want to change someone, you know, like, oh, there's a spell or, or a talent or something. Oh, it's totally broken. It's totally overpowered. Uh, we need to change that. Um, and this was, I think it started with the idea of working on Cowboys and Cthulhu, which is something that we're also doing. And I forget why I had this idea of using action points. Like, uh, everyone gets six action points, and then uh, if you, like, make an attack, it's four action points. And, and... When I, I, okay, I think where that started was the idea uh, when I was working on Delvers um, back in 2015, I think, 2016, I, I had a split movement rule where, because instead of going like, okay, you can move 30 feet and do something or move 60 feet, it didn't make any sense. Like, okay, if I can move 30 feet, I can only move one attack. How come I can't make two attacks if I don't, if I don't move at all? Mm -hmm. And so I did a split movement thing where like, if you're a human, instead of 30 feet, you had 30 feet slash 10 feet. So it was either you move 30 feet or you move 10 feet and do something. So it, it wasn't like a quite like perfect split. And this go around, I thought of action points. So like, okay, well, if I just say you get six points and attack is four, then you get two points left. Two points is five feet movement each. So very easy to figure out, okay, I can do this, move 10 feet or move five feet or, or whatever. And then I started experiment experimenting with that going, like, okay, well, what about getting multiple attacks? And so I thought about, okay, well, maybe at like level five, you get an attack reduction. So now your attacks only cost three points. So now you can not, you cannot move at all and make two attacks or you can make an attack move a little quicker. And this kind of started going into different spells like okay what if um what if one spell costs like six action points you can't do anything you gotta spend the whole turn doing it what if something costs 12 action points so you know it takes basically two rounds but instead of saying okay the spell takes like three actions or four actions and a swift action or 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 whatever you just go okay well 12 action points and you can cast maybe maybe you could move and then not lose a spell um, maybe there's an ability where you can cast a spell, pause it for a bit, resume it later. It's so whatever points you put into it, you, that still counts. And, and that was the whole thing. And then I started thinking more of the cowboy angle. Okay, well, you know, getting shot by bullets, you know, metal armor kind of went away because of guns in the first place. But I, I really wanted to have, have players have armor because in this weird West game, you're not just going to be dealing with people with guns are going to be dealing with like deep ones, dark young stuff like that. So then I thought, well, I got to put something in there. You know, no one's going to run around with no armor because oh, guns or whatever, you got other things to deal with. And then for some reason that got into the idea of damage resistance. Mm -hmm. And then 
I had I had done a DR system with Delvers initially. It was one to eight points. But in an early adventure, the players got a hold of plate armor. That was a drop off of an enemy, and they kind of had it, spent the money to have it reworked so one of the guys was close enough size could actually wear it. Then they got in a fight with Lizard Men, and after that that, that session, um, he said that the player said that he uh, he felt too safe because every time he got hit, you know they they roll like a D six plus something or D eight his plate armor's DRA. He basically took no damage most of the time. So then I thought, well, what if I just do where you get hit, you take one damage, no matter what. But that just kind of felt weird. So then I started going into a AC DR split where like armor was. Plus one AC, one DR. Plus two AC, two DR. And that worked out better. People really liked that. But then for uh, for Red Book, I decided to, you know, I'm just going to go with like more of a classic AC progression. One, two, three, up to eight. But then do it where if you have light armor, it's DR1. If you have medium armor, it's DR2. And if you have heavy armor, it's DR3. And that was pretty much fine. And then, but with the cowboy thing, I started to think, okay, well, what if, like, players got a defense bonus because, you know, you don't want to, you know, like, you don't still see gunslingers, like, decked out in heavy armor all the time. And so somehow that, I, I forget how, that fit in the idea of, okay, well, if I give everyone a, a skill and defense score, armor's just full on DR, then, you know, how could I, well, how could I handle it if I did it really high? And then, I, and then, and I don't know where this came up, I just thought of this at some point, was, okay, well... Maybe if you beat their AC by a certain point, you do more damage. Mm -hmm. And that's where every five points plus one damage. And so we've been playtesting that whole idea, and that's been working out really well. We they actually we did a playtest session a couple days ago where it was a barbarian, a bard, and a rogue. And they ended up fighting um, a skeleton that had kind of, I just said, okay, a skeleton in a catacomb is decked out in plate armor, but it's all badly damaged and rest of cells is the R4. It goes one to six right now, and that fight took a while. Not because of the DR, because Melissa kept rolling really badly. But when they started rolling, when she started rolling good, and then you know she, they were the the little gangs will take it up pretty quickly. So you know, and I asked her, okay, do you think your fights are too long? No, they're going really fast. You, know, you think it's too hard? No, no, no. Is it too hard to remember all the rules? No, no, no it's easy. So um, my whole attitude is, if her and the kids. Or like 10 and 13, if they can remember this stuff, like, okay, when you attack an enemy and then the next person attacks the same enemy, they get a plus one hit on top of that, and that that kind of feeds into the bonus damage thing. In terms of complexity, I'm trying to figure out, okay, if they can follow along, keep up with this stuff, that means it can't be that complicated. And that's, it's, it's a, uh, and I know some people, they want, they want simple rules. They want, they want to be able to just kind of roll and then, you know, add a number, do some damage, get over with as quickly as possible. And I can see the appeal of that, but I also think that, like weapons um, in D and D, a lot they're they're very uh, samey. Like if you got you know, a long sword, well okay, army sword or an axe, it's D eight slashing. And maybe they weigh different. Doesn't really matter. We're trying to make that a little more meaningful, but then also give some strategy. Like if you're playing a fighter and you got a rogue, well you want the fighter to run in first. You know, okay now he's got the enemy's attention. The rogue can slink in there, backstab him, sneak attack him up. Um, Keep that monster engaged, kind of pinned down, so we can't run after to go after the wizard who's gonna be casting spells on the side. Um, and then with with weapons, the other thing we're doing that I thought of was to add a range thing for melee weapons. So now, if like you got a skeleton coming at you and he's just got his little bony claws, and you got battle axe, mm -hmm. you're not just standing there while the skeleton walks up to you and like starts. No, you can hit him. You you, you get to make a out of turn attack against him, and this also makes weapons matter more because okay, if you got a dagger, well the guy's got an arming sword, and this is because I've been watching lots of videos of people talk about weapons because I was always curious like okay, well how are these used? What are the benefits, the drawbacks? And I learned like a spear is actually one of the best weapons, um, I think behind the pole axe. But they're saying like you know take a dagger, you know the guy's got a a sword, a proper sword. They're gonna go after you first because they got this. They got they got reach on you. So we, we had a little range thing on that, and so that's another rule we're doing. So the the this all together, the DR, the defense, um, giving classes an attack bonus because uh, it, I think it makes sense to do like like even a wizard, they can't use their magic all the time, so they they gotta find other ways to contribute, and they're gonna learn how to you know fight. Um, either yeah, they're not mainly doing stuff all the time. But they're going to learn over time, okay, how to, oh, here's how you use a sword, just 
a necessity experience. Maybe they're, you know, they're 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 sparring with their fighter buddy on the side. So you know, I, I think they need some kind of attack bonus. So that's going in there. Um, uh, hit dice. I found a way to because before it was if you're a fighter, you get six wound points, four vitality points. Then it was like something. Um, I think plus four wound points and plus two vitality points every level modified by con. And that was static. And the uh, RPG pundit he reviewed the black book thing, and he didn't like that that things weren't randomized. So I put in a little table in the red book, like, okay, if you want to randomize monster wound points and stuff, here's a little dinky table. That... I didn't really like it, um, but then I found a way to make just a big table that you roll your class hit die on, and then you know if you get like a one, that's one wound point. You get a two, that's two wound points. You get a three, that's two wound points and one vitality point, I think, and it kind of scales up like that. Up to 12 if playing a barbarian. Mm -hmm. All these changes, I think, you can't just do an errata for that. you got to do a second edition at this point. And there's more stuff besides, but I think even half of those things, it's like, I can't just go, here's an errata document, you know, here's how you do hit dice. Uh, here's, make everyone a defense card. It's like, no, because then you got to, like, reference this other side document. And then also because if there's no AC in the game anymore, that affects talents and spells and abilities that boosted AC. Yeah. Four. Now, it sounds it sounds to me that this that the approach with this second with this second edition is more of more of messing around with the core and the and the bonuses that occur, and the bonuses that occur within. Is that is that the is that the primary focus when it comes to messing with um messing with modifiers and what's what you're gonna have is randomized and what not. Um, we are. It's. That, the, the core, uh, well, okay, so the D20 thing is, that that we're not messing with. Um, the math um, of things is getting messed with quite a bit because of, you know, uh, before it was like fighters got plus one to hit and damage, and then around like level two or three they got another plus one to hit. So I kept the overall attack bonuses very low. Mm -hmm. um, but if defense is going to go up, then that's got to get messed with because I don't, I don't want to have it all scale perfectly. Mm-hmm. But I do want it to scale because I, I don't want a situation where a wizard is, eh, sorry guys, you know, I, I do something, but I gotta like I gotta nat twenty to have anything happen in the first place. So I'm trying to get like a little sweet spot with that. Uh, that getting messed with the damage, like where where the hit dice and stuff, that's not really that big of a deal because the points that you got from leveling up was essentially the average of the die roll that you would have rolled in the first place. Mm -hmm. So wizards got three because the D four is a two point five round up to a three. So you might be a little behind, you might be a little ahead. Um, that's not that big of a deal. DR goes up. It's going. For, it's going to go up to at least a baseline of six for plate mm -hmm. armor. Um, and I'm trying to get to a point where, like, you know, again, I don't. I don't want a fighter to go. I got plate armor. Now I'm invincible. But I don't want it to go where damage gets so high that the wizard's like, I'm. I'm going to get hit once and I'm, I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to find the sweet point, the sweet spot there, and that's why we're play testing to go. Okay, well, are the characters dying too quickly? Are they dying? Is they don't they don't no one cares because their DR is so high. Um, well, to that end, I'd like to I'd like to go through the classes that were in Red Book and just get just get a feel for what you what you liked about the class, what you did what you didn't like, and what you want to change. Uh so Bard, I well, I, I, yeah, I like I, all my classes. <laughs> I I'm. I was planning on starting. I was planning on starting from the top, from the top to the bottom. So the first one oh, would okay. be um, barbarian. Oh, I, yeah. I, I was gonna, I was doing that. I was thinking that as well. But then I, I guess I thought barred for barbarian for some. Reason. So barbarian, um, because they got a unarmored mechanic, um, where his barbarians, uh, you know, you think of them, they don't really wear heavy armor. And I watched a video on barbarians. Characters not wearing armor and have defense, so I was like, stick with that. Then I get to draw, you know, barbarian babe with almost no clothes on, and that's that's fine. But so so they're not like the the idea behind the barbarian was they're a fighter class. It's more about dishing out damage and then being risky and getting hit more. So their thing was, you know, you can do you can you can do that furious attack thing where you roll twice, take the highest uh, d20 roll. But you get an AC penalty, and so that one it's pretty much the same thing, except that now they get um, instead of getting an AC bonus and a damage resistance bonus when they're not wearing 
medium and heavier armor. It's just a DR bonus. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing needs to change it because they get they get the defense class thing, and then their their fierce attack thing kind of it just penalizes your defense for a little bit. But I did rig it up where now you can do it multiple times because before I had, you had to take a talent to, and it was it was weirdly I had to word it in a way to make it clear like okay you can do this with multiple attacks, but you have to this way I could just say okay negative one defense for every attack when you get multiple attacks that you want to you want to boost this way. Mm-hmm. Very easy to do that. Um, I didn't have to even make it a talent choice, but everything else but the barbarian, like the bonus damage, and you know you could take the animal tone and turn into a bear in combat. That's all staying there. I, I really like that idea. It makes it different from the fighter in other ways. So mm-hmm. that's the only tweak there is you just get the DR bonus in lighter light reinforced armor. You're good. Mm-hmm. Um, since you brought it up, I'll bring I'll bring it up here. Bard. A rare case uh, of bard. bards actually being able to survive encounters. <laughs> yeah, they don't have to get changed much at all. The the rhythm thing is still the same right now. The uh, I I've been tweaking with different ways to because I, I I some people they don't like the way the bard oh the bard music does this this well it actually it does I looked up did a little research on bards apparently there were bard like people using music to like make rocks move and stuff and transform mm-hmm. people so so that whole idea like the bard music doing all kinds of crazy stuff. That has some basis, and so I was like, okay, I'll run with that. The healing uh, was an issue because bards have a rhythm ability. They have a rhythm point thing. And you short rest to gain a rhythm back. And so you, you can't do healing with that because if you just say, okay, well, you can do that, that means bards can heal constantly, and then they could even heal themselves, short rest, get some, you know, you got to... I had to mess with that, and so I think I, I did it where if you use the healing music thing, your maximum rhythm goes down until you long rest it back up, which mm-hmm. seems kind of clunky, and I wanted to get away from that. And I think what we we did this time was, because uh, the short rest mechanic in here is first short rest is 10 minutes, second one is 30 minutes, third one is an hour long, and then you can't short rest after that because at that point you are too tired or too beat up. You can't just keep, you know, kicking back and then healing, mm-hmm. as it were. Um so bards have a thing where when you short rest, you regain more vitality points because you can't regain wound points on a short rest uh, with barring special things. And then they have another ability that goes down that tree where they they also grant temporary vitality points. So it's like over the, the cap vitality. So bards are really good at like party buffing that way. And then there's also one that you can get where I, I think I changed the, instead of spending rhythm to restore wound points, when you short rest, they restore wound points as well as vitality points. So having a bard around, they can't, they can't on spot heal like a cleric can. Mm-hmm. But if you take the time to kick back and relax, that bard's going to, everyone's going to be bouncing back quite a bit. Again, not as good as a cleric. They're not supposed to be a cleric replacement. Mm-hmm. Not that you need a cleric in the first place, but they're 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 more of like a party buff thing. And, and we've been, in the combat thing, I've been thinking they really need some ability to uh, boost in combat because they are generally, we, we rolled stats and they're not really good at hitting stuff too well. Mm-hmm. And I want to try to make it so that a bard isn't just like, you know, oh, I can't do anything. I might as well just you know, I'll just attack an enemy to get the the gang at bonus. Someone else. I, I want to. I, I got to figure that out with the bard. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess bard. I'm very happy with in terms of the music ability. They need some kind of push though for the fighting ability. Mm-hmm. So, cleric. Oh, cleric's fine. Uh, we're we're redoing the. Uh, the domain structure now, so you don't have to take healing domain, because before you had to take a domain talent, and that gave you an ability. Like, if you took healing domain, that was your restore damage thing, and then you would build on that. But instead, it's going to be every domain has a kind of a divine gift you get. So if you're a healing cleric, you heal faster then. Um, but when you make your deity, you pick domains, and then of those domains, like, you could say your god has some domains you want, because some of them, some gods have, you know, they have, I think Ares has God of Courage and, and or Courage and War. Mm-hmm. But then you go over to like Thor and he's got like a whole crap load of stuff. Storms, strength, protection. Uh, it's, it's a laundry list. So I figure, you know what? Pick whatever stuff your God has. You pick three of those. 
those are the ones, those are the miracle domains that you get access to. And then out of those three, you pick one of those, you have a gift based on that. So if you're a fire clerk, you have fire resistance. That's just part of your whole package. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get to pick a miracle. Okay. And so if you're playing a healing cleric, you get the healing, you know, domains, one of your things, healing gift, we'd say. And then you can take healing touch. You can touch someone, heal them, and then you can pick stuff to build in that regeneration. Circle of healing, spark of life in case someone dies. You know, there's a narrow window you can spend favor to bring them back to life, uh, like a defibrillator thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we are tweaking some of those. So now if you're using the healing touch, um, it's it's 1d6 wound points. But if you spend a whole minute praying over them, both hands on them, you get to roll twice, take the higher result. So this way you can have a cleric that's more like, oh, you're out of combat. Now you can do it more slowly, make it more reliable. Uh, but otherwise, they're not really going to change. They're, they're, they were great before. Mm -hmm. So next on the list would be the would be druids. No, they were also fine. Um, I might try to do a similar thing with the uh, the circles that they have access to. Like, hmm, I don't know. I can't just say you pick one circle and you're you're stuck with it because I didn't have enough talents to, you know, if you're a circle of oak, druid, you didn't have enough stuff, and if you have a circle of, sand, uh, mm -hmm. hmm, I'm I'm just banking. I'm waffling on whether you have to spend a talent to pick a circle, or you just get a circle. Maybe you have to find druids to teach to induct you into other. I, I don't know. I guess people like that because of the role playing thing, but I guess people hate that because you know I shouldn't have to go find a druid of storms to induct me in the circle of storms or whatever. I kind of like that idea. I don't know. I'll see what people think. It's one of those things where I could go either way, honestly. Um, it just boils is... down to do I want to say you, do you have to spend a talent to get access to a circle, or do you just kind of have whatever circles you want? Yeah. Next is Fighter. Uh, also, fine. <laughs> They're just getting changed. Uh, I, I've reworked some of the talents on them. I changed the exploit mechanic, actually. So before it was... Because uh, I know, like, let's say you played 3rd edition. I want to trip the enemy. Okay, well, i going to make an attack against you. Uh, there's a whole back and forth. To the point of players like, yeah, I'm not going to... Never mind. I'm just going to hit them. Mm -hmm. And so in this one, we wanted to do it where... You know, you can trip an enemy. There's there's no opportunity to attack like that. You, you can just try. They're going to make a opposed roll to see if you knock them. Um, but for fighter maneuvers, before I did it where you would say, like, trip attack, exploit, 18+. plus. So what that meant was uh, if you rolled to hit them and your total roll was 18 or higher, you did your damage and stuff, but on top of that, you got to make a trip attack. They took it for turn. Now what I'm doing instead, because of the way I flip things, is now it says, like, exploit 10+, plus. where now it's if you exceed their defense roll by 10 or more points, um, you get to do the free trip attack, but you can spend skill points whenever you level up, you get a skill point. You can drop that into athletics or whatever. Or you can, if you have an, if you have an exploit talent, you can drop that number by one, and you can do it over and over and over. So it's like level five, you keep dumping points in the trip attack, well, now you got to beat their AC, their defense, five or higher, if you trip on them so now you can really you know okay i want to do this ability i want to get really good at it you, you can control that better or you could just deal with that at all and just go with stuff like you know plus one damage all two in a weapon plus one dr when you're wearing armor plus one defense and you got a shield you know mm -hmm. we want players to choose their complexity so uh but as far as fighters is that's really the only thing we're changing is flipping the exploit thing around yeah um monk uh monk is not going to be in the next book um, that's going into our very uh, cultural, appropriative, oriental Dungeons and Delvers. I, I got a bunch of stuff in that one. Uh, samurai. I, I, Genja, Are you going to be making Wu, some Karatura references in that book? I I don't think so because <laughs> I, I never got into... Uh, yeah, I was in the in 2nd edition mostly, and the 3rd edition came out, and then the Oriental Dungeons book came out in 3rd edition. That's actually what I have the only yeah, real experience with is that one. Oriental Adventures Third Edition was ba was basically was basically them piggybacking off of Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah, I, I did see a lot of uh, 
in Legend of the Five Rings, no, in Rokugan, this thing doesn't exist. This race doesn't exist. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on that stuff, and, and actually I found out that they're kind of accurate in a lot of things they were picking in there. They got some, like, maybe like a word wrong with the Wu Gen. I think the, I found that Wu Ren or just Wu was a more accurate thing for a wizard, but like the Shugenja, that's an actual, I, you know, it's a, I think a mountain priest type thing. Mm -hmm. It's a, um, when it comes, whenever I've I've discussed the accuracy thing in the past when regarding regarding Rokugan, I've had to deal with this question for twenty years. But um, the that pr the problem the problem with trying to take that approach with um, Rokugan is the fact that Rokugan is not Japan, and this is something a lot of people seem to have difficulty grasping. I just my 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 takeaway from the book was that it's not Japanese. It's it's a mixture of like Japanese, Chinese, Hindu stuff even in there. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's not like one culture. It's an amalgamation of like, ooh, what kind of looks cool? Kind of what's kind of cool on that, or just whatever they thought would be interesting to to play Which with. Um, isn't too isn't too far removed from how they how they're handling European fantasy and D and D proper. Yeah, yeah. They kind of just mash it all together. Um, <laughs> so the, the armor doesn't really make sense for the time period things might be in or the weapon choices you know they they wouldn't make, like the rapier you know if you're trying to do like i think 1400s rapiers didn't exist then plate armor uh, like proper plate armor is like way near the end when like primitive guns would exist so there's a but who cares it's not like you're not really trying to do like realistic european stuff you're kind of go like well no, okay. there's other ga there's other games for that yeah that would do it halfway decent and, and i'm trying to make like weapons more in line with how they would quote unquote realistically work but i'm not trying to go like you know at least to make it european mm -hmm. the monk removal is just the fact that you look at the whole book what's asian in there the monk it's weird and even even your even your monk is <laughs> even the monk art for the in your um, book well he well he's a go you have a golem monk so he's a big honking rock in robes that that's and that's from a Sundered World. Um, I forget what class it was for, because uh, that's the Cathan race, which are living stone things. And mm -hmm. it was in Sundered World. People wanted in this thing, so I put it in this thing. He wasn't a monk in the in the Sundered World, but I forget what class he was. But I thought he looked cool, so I put him in here. And he's got more of like a Buddhist monk robe vibe going on. So that's yeah. that's uh, a whole. Uh, but but so you look in the book and it's just like okay monk yeah, I like I like the way we did the monk I think it's a great monk class it's got all this cool stuff you can do with it and you know but it, again it was like look at their second edition okay you had a you had the oni mage the ogre mage which is a Japanese oni thing and then you had the taco octopus guy at the back of the book so you had these like little random uh, oriental monsters and it was just kind of strange you know you have all this decidedly mostly european-ish stuff and then oh by the way here is a japanese demon and an octopus monster mm -hmm. you know i know i will save all that see I, I didn't put um rakshasas in because i was like no if i want to do like a hindu thing i'll keep that for there mm -hmm. i'll try to do a good job of it i just don't want to have like hey here's our here's druids and paladins and bars and by the way there is a bull-headed spider japanese demon just yeah. or and here's katanas because why? Mm -hmm. So um, that'll go in the Oriental book. Mm -hmm. um, so next up would be Paladin. Uh, I can't think of anything I'm actually going to change on Paladin because it's pretty damn cool. At the very least, you're not going to do anything stupid like say, like say that Paladins can be just can be just reflavored. Um, so, can, that pal that paladins can be reflavored as samurai, and no, I'm never letting that go. Okay, so so I thought about because I'm going through the Oriental stuff. You know, I got a big document. I'm trying to I was trying to figure out like, okay, what can like a Tanuki do? What can a Kitsune do? You know, like because I really wanted to nail it down. Like, you know, what can they do in the context of a starting race that's not overpowered? Um, and when it comes so I got to, the when it comes to those. I've seen a fair. F I remember, um, I remember Tenra just ha just had a just had a catch-all subtype of um, Ayakashi. Instead, instead of trying to instead of trying to fiddle with how would you handle a Tanuki, how would you handle a Kitsune, um, and so and so on. No, you j no, you have it. You have Ayakashi. You have a set of a set of effects and a set of modifiers that you pick and choose from, 
and you bu you build your equivalent um, Tanuki or you build your equivalent Kitsune through that. Well, I think I got it handled pretty well with like with what they can do, especially the Tanuki. Like they they can uh, they're good at shape changing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be like a racial classing that they can build on to master that better if you want to do that. Yeah. But they're not. There's not going to be racial classes default. It's going to be an option. How they did in third edition under Turkey. Although, if you know a lot about this stuff, I'm going to hit you up for the uh, how to do a proper kind of spirit folk thing that's more than just kind of like a reskinned elf. But this, that's, the why, samurai, that's, why I br that's why I brought up the the um, the Ayakashi because because trying trying to trying to cover trying to cover each an individual potential um, spirit fo spirit folk just in Shin just in Shintoism, um, you'd end up ha you'd end up adding like two or three hundred pages worth. Yeah, it'd be a so, nightmare, because, especially because so, the, the the lore isn't consistent on you know what can they do, what are they supposed to do, and that's how you yeah. end up with like you know like ghouls. Oh, they were like uh, Arabian demons that ate dead people, but in some legends they could change their form, and in some other legends, if they ate a body, they could take their face. But which one? It's kind of yeah, that's like a vampire. that's why that's all why map. that's why I'm suggesting a uh, well, a to, build your to... a build your own method. Well, so, and that I'll have to, I don't know the tenor thing you're mentioning. I'll have to uh, get back to you on that when we're done with this. Um, but for, like, Samurai, just play a fighter. Just play a freaking fighter. Fighter and pick Samurai stuff. And, and, and I remember, I know you're talking about, because they said um, a, a ninja would be a, a monk with, a, with a, a weird, and I'm thinking, a ninja would just be like a rogue. They, you don't I'm, I'm, do any, I'm, more you I'm more picking on a couple infamous um, WTF moments that were in the that were in the player's handbook and DM's guide for D for um fifth edition. Yeah, yeah, they that's, had, that's a they had like ninja <laughs> as a as a sub as a subclass of monk for some reason. They called it way yeah, of the shadow you... hand, but I'm getting but it's a friggin' ninja. Um, yeah, but you could just go. I, I'm, I'm a rogue, and I have all the ninja. I have all the sneaky stuff, so I'm a ninja. And and uh, if you want to do like have the ninja magic, well then, um, the uh, the Arcane wizard class I'm doing. Yeah, you could do something like that, where like you just get some. You you could take. Well, okay, if you're gonna do it in Delverts, you go with the rogue, multi-class, and the wizard. Take some illusion, um, uh, take the illusionist talent, and then go down the illusionist tree to make you know little images, or like you know if you want to make smoke clouds, whatever you want to do. You know, there's ways to do it. Yeah. Um, but you don't gotta go like, oh, you're a monk. It's like, no, no, monks are in in D and D. D and D has monks. They're very much like punching things, and that's ninjas have all kinds of tools they would they're be also using. The, they're also the poster boy for M A D. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you wouldn't. You would see in, in Delvers, we don't really have ability score requirement type um, assumptions, so you can get away. Because like, in, in the playtest we're doing, the barbarian I think has plus one strength and constitution. Mm -hmm. that, that that that's all she's got. Yeah. Um, the bard I think has plus two charisma, but like negative one. Con so we roll the stats and. Oh, um, you're familiar with MAD, right? Yeah, where you got to have multiple ability dependency, where you got to have all your stuff really high because the game math like kind of is set where like okay, you're level five, you're gonna have a it's, a plus three it's from this thing and that thing. And if you don't have it, you can't do these mm -hmm. basic things. It's less to do with having high stats in in matters and more of and more of what stats the cl the um, classes kit will be relying on. Yeah, you need you need you need a lot of high stats to pull it off. Like you need strength, like I, because I, I think fourth edition Paladin had the problem. Oh, you gotta have a high strength and constitution, but also you gotta have a high charisma. Not and for, then fourth edition Paladin, not really. It the depends big, on the thing you went with. The bigger offender was star packed warlocks. Uh, they have been charisma to attack, and was it con? Was the oh no intelligence? What was their secondary stat? I, it's been a while, but I do I do distinctly recall that um, a lot of star packed warlock powers were all they over the place. They flipped between two of them. Yeah, they they flipped between two different stats mm -hmm. at least. Which and I remember people get mad about that too. Oh, uh, which is what which is why they end up become why they end up becoming the poster child. But um, t when it I'd, when it comes to when it comes to the next one the. Of course, this also brings me to the um, the most snake bitten class in D and D's history, and this is, this isn't a recent problem. Um, the ranger. It's not as snake bitten in Dungeons and Delvers, but it has a reputation. Yeah, it's why people 
they'll complain about it on like a Facebook group, like oh, Ranger's sucking its leg. Yeah, can I offer you a uh, Dungeons and Delvers in these trying times? Because uh, again, Delvers was my my okay. Like I, I like D and I like the idea of D and D. I don't like how a lot of things work in D and D. I got to change all this stuff. And Ranger was a big one because I've always hated favorite enemy. Like oh, pick a monster and then really hope that your DM puts it in there. And I think we found a very elegant solution. And the thing that frustrates me is that, you know, we're just like, you know, mom and pop, like playing games for fun. You got, you tell me a whole development team at Watsi, they never could figure this out. Like, and after, after, how, try, how after like, redoing the Ranger three times in the last six years. Yeah. So, so in case anyone listening to this, you don't know what that is. The Ranger is how we did it was, um, Level 1, and then 5, 10, 15, 20, you get a thing called a hunter bonus, plus 1. And so what you do is you pick an enemy, like a goblin, orc, or whatever. Um, you get a plus 1 to damage rolls, as well as a variety of skill checks pertaining to the enemy. Now, the thing is, is that um, you can... Every level, you can spend a skill point to pick another monster. And you get, a, you get one skill point every level. Rangers actually get bonus skill points as well. So rangers, you know, like, okay... Uh, we're dealing with undead. Well, you don't have to go. You know, the DM, you don't have to ask the DM. You know, hey DM, for my my hunter thing, what are we fighting so I can use it? Oh, you, it's you're gonna cat come someone dead. It can work out that way, but then if you're playing the game, you know, you're going into a forest. Oh, there's gonna be gnolls in the forest. Well, then hey, you level up, you put a skill point, and now you have the hunter bonus applies to gnolls now, and you can keep doing that over and over and over again, and it's not unbalanced because. Rangers don't get a scaling damage bonus like a fighter does. So the ranger is essentially spending skill points to get a damage bonus to keep up with what the fighter gets. In addition to, okay, you also get a bonus to track the monster, identify the monster, lore checks about the monster, mm -hmm. all these things about it. So it's a skill point for damage plus a bunch of stuff on the side. So it was never like an unbalancing to do in the first place. Yeah. Um, but, it, but then at level 5, the bonus goes to plus 2. So then you can start getting plus 2 against all these things and plus 3 and plus 1. Yeah. It's automatically. As far as the ranger goes, I don't, I, I can't see us changing anything. Oh, uh, every class, wore, so, so, um, any class can wear any armor, mm -hmm. and so actually this, this will indirectly benefit rangers. Uh, I found out that apparently you can stealth in all kinds of armor without a problem, except for plate armor. You just have to walk a certain way. And it's very quiet. So we're actually getting rid of um, stat penalties. Like so, before we had it where okay, because you know the, the the myth of armor weighs it down and hard to move and stuff. Nah, that's not a thing apparently. Um, so there's no skill checks to anything except for stealth in the heavy armor category. You could take a skill perk with stealth to remove that penalty, and then this boils down to how fast you're moving um, mm -hmm. and other factors like concealment and stuff. So rangers will now be able to wear any armor they want. Um, the, the drawback is, you know, you're strong enough to wear it because we're really drilling down now into carrying capacity. You're not going to just run around, you know, like Lord of the Rings style with a backpack full of crap. Like, all, you know, you're going to have to bring pack animals along. You're going to have to uh, watch what you carry because... I'd say a better example would be Elder Scrolls level shit in that case. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like in D and D, they they said they have it set up where like in fifth edition, um, was like you know the the carrying capacity is basically at a point where you can carry whatever you want, no problem. And I think that's stupid. Uh, so for yeah, Delver, because you're encouraging Redbird... pack rats, and pack rats are well, already it... a, already a problem in video game RPGs. Well, that comes across as really lazy, and and I, I think there's like a, I think there <laughs> there there's there's a fun part of the game to go and like okay, well. How much food do we bring? Can we carry it? What do we got to bring? Because, I mean, they, they phased out hirelings in 3rd edition and up pretty much entirely. I don't, We never use them in 3rd edition. And in Delvers for Red Book, I actually... I forget what I... I looked at some stuff this years ago, and I was like, okay, I guess an average person kind of carry maybe around this amount of stuff, and then I, I use that as a baseline. So it was like, if you're playing a fighter with Strength Plus 2, you could just carry your weapons and armor and your base equipment without going into lightly encumbered. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I might revisit that and pull it back down a little bit. So now it's like, you know, you, you're, you're going to be encumbered, so you're going to have to bring, like, a porter along. You're going to have to bring, uh, whenever we, we game, the player, uh, wife and kids, always, they always uh, buy a donkey mm -hmm. just to carry their excess crap. Yeah. And we track, we track encumbrance, and, and, you know, oh, it's not a bookkeeping game. No, no, fuck that. Like, 
this is like like going into a dungeon, being an explorer or whatever. It's it's more than just like okay, we we throw a backpack full of crap, we kick in the door, kill everything. So no no no, it should be treated more as like an actual expedition, like you see him doing in the mummy. Um, bring some people on, carry all the heavy crap out, and you, know, you got to pay them, and that gives you something to do with your money. You know, uh, you got expenses, you got to maintain your stuff, you got to actually track your food and buy food. Um, that's not into the range. That's just thought about like, oh, that's another thing is armor proficiencies are going away, weapon proficiencies. Um, anyone can get like any weapon now. You just got to spend a skill point to know how to use it properly. So now you can have a wizard with two-handed sword if you really wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, won't be as good as a fighter with it, but they could still do it. And if they get hit in combat, they're probably going to get splattered in a couple of hits. But yeah, at the right abjuration magic, you could pull it off, you know, maybe get a wizard rocking around in chainmail armor and a spear and, you know, maybe cast some spells. It's the whole, oh, jester thing, that's... that's... Yeah. Um, Ranger's not really changing. Yeah. Rogue. Um, indirectly, perhaps because I might be blowing up the skill list a little bit. Like, so instead of thievery, covering all your thieving abilities, it might go back to the uh, uh, open locks, pickpocket, disable trap thing um might do that but i might just make the like thievery is a all-encompassing skill and then put skill perks where you can put points into to kind of shadow run-esque specialize in it like so if you get thievery it's a plus two you put a skill point into I'm, open locks so uh, that, that's a plus three i'm honestly in favor of the in favor of the latter because the big reason I end up picking on games like Shadowrun and a lot of skill-heavy games that I played through in the 90s is a lot of them got way out of hand with the, with way too many skills and a lot of those skills having very so specialized use. use. <laughs> yeah, okay. While still, okay. Ha while still having a very limited um, pool, pool that, that you're also spending on everything else. Um uh, they tr well, one skill we're getting rid of is per well, okay, we're not getting rid of perception, but you can't. So you get it at level one plus one, and then every five levels it goes up by one automatically because perception's like the skill that everyone you you you'd keep putting points into it all the time because you got to notice stuff. So I figure, you know what? If I make it an auto up, reflecting though, know, you're an adventure, dangerous lifestyle. You're naturally getting better watching your ass, you know, like trying to avoid getting attacked. So I figure uh, it makes sense just to do it automatically. That way you can go, instead of going, I level up, perception. You can go, yeah. okay, level up. Ooh, what am I going to, hmm, I got a skill point. Learn a new weapon, learn a new armor, get a perk, new skill, weapon trick, yeah. new spell um, upgrade for wizards. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's things you can do. A lot of things we're going to let you do with those now, so they're, they're, it's more, I guess, more meaningful, more interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. To that but end, to the rogue, no, not really. um, fo following up with that, sor um, sorcerer. Ooh, I don't think. Uh, I'm, I mean, we might rejuggle some of the stuff because I was. We had a transformation thing that we ditched because it was really convoluted, like uh, in the between the black book and the red book. If you're playing a dragon sorcerer. Um, there was a mechanic where when you ran out of mana, a bunch of stuff activated. And that was supposed to reflect, because uh, in the 5th the edition D&D &D Next playtest, they had a sorcerer thing where like the more you cast spells, your character was supposed to like transform. And I thought that was a really cool idea. It made it really unique. And then, of course, they're like, ah, that's, that's too interesting. We're going to get rid of that. We tried to do a similar thing, and it actually ended up, you know, okay, well... Meta mana, so hold on, guys. Okay, that turns on, that turns on, that turns on, that turns on. Okay, so I gotta remember all this crap that I gotta deal with. And then when you run out of vitality points, more stuff activated on top of that. Um, and that was supposed to be like your sorcery, your casting spell, so it's changing you. Um, your body is reacting reflexively to, def to protect itself because you know you're, you're you're getting exhausted, you're getting hurt. So if you're a dragon sorcerer and you, you did, if you had like the um, the lashing tail ability, where you grow a tail that you can use to smack things around. You had the thickened scales ability, so your your AC went up. When you're out of mana, I forget which one of those two things that automatically activate, even if you hadn't used it yet. Um, 
and then at a vitality point, they both turn on. So like you could eventually, if you had all the dragon talents in a certain way, you would, you know, I'm out of vitality points. I turn into a friggin' dragon automatically. That was really convoluted. That was really complicated. So we, we paired all that. We dialed all that down. Um, I might look into bringing some of that back, but where the sorcerer is, it, it's as it is conceptually, it makes sense with what it does. Mm -hmm. So I don't needs changing for a balance reason or a mechanical reason or or to keep in line with the flavor reason. Maybe I can get that. Maybe I could just do something minor and something simple. Maybe if you're a dragon source, you run out of mana, you start bleeding fire or something, and, and that, that fire damage just goes up automatically, and that's really all it has to be. It doesn't have to turn on like five or six different talents at the same time. So right now, tentatively, no. I think it's in a good place. Yeah. So, next would be the se the second the second caster that you have, or, or rather, um, another caster. I should I should note because then we get into half casters. And I don't feel like going down that rabbit hole. But warlocks. Warlock. I might be changing this one quite a bit. Uh, I like the uh, the dungeon world warlock we did. Um, was you have to you have because the always warlock concept was you have a patron and the patron gives you your magic abilities and so it seemed really strange like in third and fourth edition you have a patron oh here's your magic spells and then they never ever care what you did with it they never ever got in touch with you like hey hey buddy you know i i uh niggerath here and i gave all this magic you know hey i need you to go do no it never happened um I think it might have been hinted that you could get the, like, maybe you could do a little metric, but it was like, don't take the player's powers away. So, and so it's kind of like having a, like a cleric, but like, a, like a god saying, you know, hey, here's your magic cleric. And the cleric's like, sweet, I'm going to go do whatever I want. God's like, yeah, I don't really care. Um, so in Dungeon World, we tied it into a, uh, you have to talk to the patron and you got a boon mechanic that you had to spend. And so, like, you'd get it back when you did stuff for your patron. Um, and there was a whole back and forth thing there. And so Delvers, I want to do a similar thing, but uh, I couldn't make it really work in a way where like, because I, I this player said, I don't want to play a warlock because I get one spell that I got to go based on a relic. Like screw that. I'll just be a wizard or something like, you know, something that can cast cast spells. So I had to like compromise with like the Eldritch power mechanic where the difference between a warlock and a wizard is Warlocks get they don't get as many spell options as a wizard does. They can't just automatically learn new spells like a wizard can. And but their their magic is uh, it's very safe. You you never have to hurt yourself. You're never going to hurt yourself accidentally casting warlock magic. But then there's also bits in there about like okay the player has a patron. The patron will get in touch with them periodically and be like you know hey you have to go do this stuff. And as a, cl like a cleric they can switch their powers away whenever they want to. Um, I might be changing the warlock to more of a his the elder power thing. That's more like, that's like your borrowed power, and you'll get like bits of it over time from your patron, like they'll dole it out to you. And then if you need more, you talk to your patron, and because they, they have an ability they can just do that and say, like, hey, I need, more, I need more juice. And the patron may go, like, okay, well, if you want something, you know, we got to come to an agreement, and then I'll give you like five more ultra power or whatever, like if, if you really, really need it or something. But I might just do it the third edition Warlock, where you get essentially at will magic. But then you gotta um, every time you level up, you gotta talk to your patron. And they'll almost like well, they they will give you the power they want to give you, the spells they want, or you can do something to choose. Uh, but it's gonna be like I wanted to. I'm trying to think if I do it where it's always at will. Like pick an ability and you can use it all the time and it never runs out. And that's the joy of being a warlock is yeah you're you're on someone's someone's got their strings around you. But unlike a wizard, you're never going to kill yourself casting a spell. But you don't got to work for it either, so it's a, you know... And at this point, I don't think the Warlock needs to change. I think it's still solid class. Um, flavor mechanics, it's it's very different from a wizard. And it's different from a sorcerer. And it's different from a cleric, different from a bard, which is what I really wanted was classes that have flavor that support it. So I think... I might do it, I might not. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, the last one is Wizard, since you mentioned that one. Wizard uh, is getting the change. Um, they used to get bonus talents. And that was because, you know, every other class, 
wizards were the one where it made sense where they should be able to, like, if they find a spell, they find a spell book or whatever, they should be able to learn the spells and then cast them. So, you know, Sorcerer, I think, got one. Essentially, you got one spell. When you leveled up, you pick a new ability. You, you expand your power. Warlock, you, you are granted a new ability. Wizard, I want more flexibility, so I gave them... Um, well, some levels they'd get one talent, which they could use on a spell. Some levels they'd get two talents. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm getting rid of those because I'm doing it instead is like, let's say you take the, the illusion spell. Hmm. Instead of saying everything, because it it, before it was illusionist, you can create like a small immobile image. And then there are talents that built on that where you can make a bigger image, you could make it move. There was like animated illusion. There was a uh, ghost sound, so you can give it sound. Then went down to something where like eventually you had like phantasmal killer, so you could actually make your illusions kill things. But you'd have to get all these talents in a row, and you know that, that could take like uh, like little five or six, which I don't think that's big of a deal. The guy that played the the, the wizard, he loved like oh I can look, you know I can. 1d4 points to just make a solid thing, 2d4 to make it move, 3d4 to make it kill people. Like he thought that was a really cool idea. Yeah. Um, and I and I was because I was thinking of going back to like make like a true dancing system. But for this, I'm going to scrap the bonus talents and just say you spend skill points now to upgrade spells in small ways. So you know if you want your illusion to move, that will be a skill point, not an entire. And that's just your wizard. Like you know he studies his spells and he learns like. But like ways to modify them in different, um, like not in major ways. Like you can't, you can't go skill point to turn an illusion into phantasmal terrain or hallucinatory terrain. Like you can't make like this huge big area. That's a different spell entirely. Mm-hmm. But just to make your move, your illusions move or make noise, I don't feel like that's really warrants entire talent expenditure. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that would be the one way I would tweak wizards. But other, and also I'm getting you don't you no longer have to take like the evoker talent. To unlock the evocation tree, instead you pick a specialty at level one, and that just means you're you're better with like evocation magic. Then uh, at level five, ten, fifteen, twenty, there are masteries you can use to like pick new schools you're good with, or uh, to like even reduce the drain cost, um, or even to get a bonus on concentrating on spells like if you get hit because we're gonna we're redoing combat as well to a phased system. So spells go off last, so wizards are going to really want to play it smart. Like, if I try to cast a spell, I'm going to get shot. I might lose my spell because I'll mm-hmm. move DC 10 plus damage concentration check to lose it. So that's the... It's a slight tweak, honestly, and we, we might we, I mean, we, we might reduce how some of the spells work or whatever, like, based on, you know, that we think they suck, that no one care about them. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, they're not really changing a whole lot. I, I, like, the, the, I like the willpower mechanic. Now, with that in with that in mind, I remember I remember you mentioning on on Facebook a bit ago that you were tooling around with bringing in weapon speeds. No, uh, uh, not speeds, ranges. Maybe I said speeds at some point, but no, we're not thinking of speeds right now because I I did a thing, a mechanic where like if you had a dagger, it was like supposed to be plus one initiative, and then like big sword would be like plus zero or something like that because like oh you could draw a dagger and stab really fast but then that was like okay combat starts what are you going to do attack with a dagger attack the the dagger oh that guy's dead now what are you going to do now or you get your dagger knocked out of your hand how does that like so how do you mess with the initiative count that you got um with if weapons have speeds essentially but then we even got rid of like now the default is combat starts one player rolls initiative DM rolls initiative, highest goes first, so you guys just go in whatever order you want. Um, that was just to speed it up, um, get it over with, because uh, it was, especially online play, which is what we were doing a lot, it was like, roll initiative, everyone, gotta go to Discord, find them as an initiative thing, figure out who goes when, so it's just easy to say, okay, you know what, roll a d20, you got, okay, you guys go first, whatever order, I don't care. And I thought, you know what, that's kind of how it worked before, older editions, but you rolled a d6. Mm-hmm. So I thought I was gonna go with that, and then and then dexterity becomes less important because it's already a very important score. Mm-hmm. But weapon, we're doing weapon ranges, and that's like okay, your dagger's got range of your punch is zero, dagger's one, short sword is two, arming sword is three. 
two handed sword is four, and I think spirit is five. So like, you know, if you got a dagger and that guy's got an army sword, and you go charge him, he's gonna hit you first. If he, if he's aware of you, he's gonna get to hit you first because his sword's got longer range. So he's gonna be able to like, he's not gonna stand over him. He's gonna like poke at you at least. Mm-hmm. Um, but the caveat is that when you're fighting someone, um, they are engaged with you. While they're engaged with you, their focus is on you. So that means other players can run around them and try to get up behind them uh, and attack them without any problems. So that that's another thing we're trying to add some kind of combat. We're not trying to make the game overly strategical, but some very slight things where it now becomes more important to go like, you know, the rogue's like, I'm going to wait till the fighter goes in. And the wizard's like, I'm going to wait until this guy does his thing. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get stabbed. Um, and just to like... You know, so it's less of like, I'm going to go to hit the guy, and then no one really, it doesn't really matter how it works out. And also prioritize certain weapon types. Mm-hmm. Most players uh, are probably going to want a spear. It mm-hmm. does fine damage, and it has armor penetration, and it's got a good range. So we're going to be your default now. Mm-hmm. Uh, is historically accurate as well, which I kind of like. Yeah. And no one ever used spears before, before when I played the game. Now it's like, you know, spears, they do a little less damage in a sword and an axe, but they got a good range, and you can throw them, and 10-foot attack away, so... And also, if they break, get a new stick, put the spearhead on the new stick, you're good to go. Because we have weapon breakage there as well. Mm-hmm. So, bring some extra spear halves when you're going adventuring. Mm-hmm. And... Now, are you are you planning on doing once you've got once you've got things a little further along? Are you planning on crowdfunding this? Oh, well, I don't need edition? to now because uh, we have we can use whatever art we already have. Mm-hmm. But we got a lot of good pictures in there. Some of them I'm not really happy with, and I've been I've been practicing different drawing techniques, so we might change some stuff up. But a big part of like why art takes was because I got to think about how I want to draw it, and then I got to. I do a bunch of sketch it. so so I can just if I want just want to redraw things in a new style I can just go kill okay, well, I like the pose I like the composition I can just redo that and I'm also better at it but we don't need to I mean we could just recycle if we wanted to mm-hmm. um, most of the writing would be essentially done but there's only enough crowdfunding at this point. before it was uh, time spent not doing other work like actual job job work doing this instead. Need some cash to compensate for that, but mm-hmm. you know, yeah, it's basically yeah. done. <clears throat> I can, I can understand, I can understand that. When do you, th- um, do you have a window in mind as far as when you think you'll have something, um, tangible? Um, no, I don't want to say, yeah, X amount of months or whatever, because who knows what's going to happen when. Mm-hmm. Um, but the plan is to just put out a like a, a black book type book where level one to five, but with way more stuff than we had in black book. Mm-hmm. It'd be a, a bigger book, but it'd be kind of like, and it wouldn't be a, a digest book. It'd be like a letter. Uh, something like that where, you know, here's like the basic game. I might do the full 20 levels actually for like four classes of the standard four and then four races. And then that a player's handbook and then do a monster a DMG and then a monster manual proper and then do like an advanced player's book on the side that has all the extra classes that you don't really need for a uh, like a, a, a classic D&D experience and also that would cut down on page count because mm-hmm. we, we, we wouldn't put like the the warlock in there necessarily, or like the Kytheran race, like this. Here's here's some normal races, normal classes. Here's like the normal game, and then you can get more outrageous with the advanced book. You know, throw in mm-hmm. dragon people and stuff if you really want to. Yeah, and we, I'll certainly be keeping a, a close eye on how that kind of, how that kind of thing develops, and pro, and probably inevitably yelling at you over certain over certain details or certain overlooks. But no, and that's that's great. I, I like if, if people don't like something, um, you got to tell us what you don't like and what we should do differently. And if we agree, we'll do it. But a lot of times, you know, we do agree because we're looking at it from well, here's what we like, what makes sense to us. It might not make sense to you, or you might be go like, like you, you know, saying, well, instead of doing five different spirit races, do a vague, amorphous spirit archetype and then just let players pick traits out of it to build their own their own yokai, and then 
that saves on uh, that saves on page count and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about doing that. I'm all over here going, oh, Tanuki got to be its own race. Kitsune got to be its own race. Uh, Nico Bito got to be its own race. Which and the thing is, they all transform into animals, so it's kind of like I really need three different races that all. Oh, that turns into a cat. That's a fox. That's a panda. Mm -hmm. But with all that said, hey, dog. yeah. With all that said, I I'd like to sincerely thank you for once again coming back to the temple to enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh yeah, totally. Anytime, man. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>